Welcome to JSA TV, your virtual newsroom for telecom professionals. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya. Joining me here today from Iceland, we have Mr. Bjarni Dorvardesen. He's the CEO of Hibernian Networks. Bjarni, welcome to JSA TV. Jamie, always great to be with you. Capacity Magazine has voted Project Express. Hibernia Express's transatlantic cable bill the fastest, highest capacity connection between New York and London, soon to soon to be turned on this, this fall. They voted Project Express the number one project of the year. So right now the Express cable ships are out in the Atlantic, physically laying that cable as we speak. It's an amazing physical feat. Can you please describe for us, Bjarni, in detail this feat for our viewers? Um, we're more than happy to, and of course, as you would uh, imagine, I very much agree with capacity that this is the most exciting project of the year, um, and this is the most exp exciting project of the century, I, th I think. Um, it is, as you know, the first transatlantic submarine fiber cable that is laid uh, for the past 13 years, and, um, see, th and that's despite the capacity demand continuing to skyrocket between those two biggest capacity markets in the world, uh, London and New York. But um, a project like this, it's not an, an overnight uh, success. It, is, it, it has been a long time coming. We've been planning it for over five years. We actually started early in 2010 to contemplate what, when will uh, the world, the world of the transatlantic capacity, when will uh, the world need more capacity between the two continents, North America and Europe. And, um, and what should that new capacity, what should that new cable look like? So we uh, decided if and when we build a cable, it needs to be the biggest capacity, it needs to be brand new route, and it needs to be the fastest route. So those are the, those are the three criteria. Because as you know, the transatlantic, transatlantic market is fiercely competitive. Um, so in order to be competitive and in order to be able to offer the same prices as we have been offering, we had to be able to pull in various revenue sources, not only the being proud of being the, the, uh, the cheapest and, and cheerful operator. So that's why we said diversity, latency, and capacity. That's going to be, uh, has to be the name of the game here. So that's what we started in 2010. The steps that you could go through when you're planning or coming up with and planning a process like this, project like this, it is first, it's the business analysis as you uh, would think. Um, just what is the capacity demand now? What is the uh, supply? When is there going to be a new, uh, new, when is there going to be a need for a new cable? So that's the business case and we put that together in 2010. The next step is then to do a desktop study to decide, okay, once you have decided to connect New York to London, you have to decide uh, what's the rough route that you're going to take. And that's the desktop study. So you take a map of the ocean um, and you just, with a pen and a paper or with, with uh, modern technology, you just map, map the route with a very well-known um, information about what the ocean bed looks like. The next step then is, once you've decided uh, within a few kilometers or meters sometimes where the cable should lay, you go out and you have um, physical ships do the survey. So you, you actually you, uh, you look at the ocean bed, you confirm that it is what the desktop study assumed it was, or it uh, finds an obstacle, an old shipwreck, or um, something is just not the way people had uh, assumed. So you may have to tweak the route a bit. Uh, so once you've done that, that uh, physical survey, the third step is then to uh, manufacture the cable. And our partner in, in crime here is TE Subcom. They've been working very well with us uh, for the past couple of years. And, and, and they've been manufacturing the 4,500 kilometers of cable. Now, 4.5 million meters of cable, it takes some time to manufacture that, as you can uh, imagine. But that is now all accomplished. So the fourth step is to, is to lay the cable. So that's the physical laying of the cable. And now we have three ships in the Atlantic. All the 4,500 kilometers are loaded um, on these ships, and they're laying it 
starting in UK, uh, starting in, in um, Canada, and eventually up to uh, Ireland as well, that's because we have the bronze going into court. Um, and now they have actually finished laying about 2,000 kilometers off the 4,500. So we're, we're getting close to RFS. So that's the, that's the four steps that you, would, that, that you have to go through when, when planning for and actually laying the, the cable. And it's just an awesome process in my head. You physically surveyed the Atlantic Ocean, found the most direct path, and are now, you know, creating and and then deploying this fiber into the ocean. It's 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 really stunning when you think about it. And, and as we lay the lay out the cable, as you know, Jamie, you there's separate process when it comes to, uh, or depending on how deep the the ocean is where you are laying the cable, and you separate it uh, roughly uh, in two categories. One is the shallow water, and the other one is deep water. And when you have shallow water, you actually have to have double armored cable um, where you have the, the fiber, uh, and you actually have, have this piece in the middle, and then you have um, armoring around it, and then isolation, another ar armoring. And that's the thickness of your forearm. Um, when you're burying it, but then this is the uh, the cable that actually lays on the ocean bed when you have deep water. So that's thousands of kilometers of this uh, type of cable with six fiber pairs, with um, with repeaters or amplifiers every 70 to 80 kilometers. And you would think that it would be reversed that the thicker armor would be necessary for the deep waters, but it's more dangerous in the shallow areas. Yes, in shallow water you have to bury it actually one to three meters. Then the, the ships are actually pulling a plow as they're laying the cable, and the, so the cable goes into the ground. And, and that all uh, has to be, it ha you have to have a stronger cable to uh, endure that, and also to endure the reason for, for plowing it in is that there's a risk of anchors, or the risk of fishing gear being dragged over the cable, and you certainly want to... Um, want to have an armored cable to survive fishing gear being dragged over it. Now in deep water where you have, uh, where you have this cable, then uh, it just lies on the ocean bed. Nothing is happening down there. There are no currents that are dragging it back and forth. So it has to be as light as possible because that, it can be three, four, even five kilometers down there or even deeper. And then the sheer just weight of the cable of four or five or six kilometer of cable hanging, dangling from the ship is such that the cable, if it, if it was very heavy, it would be at risk of just snapping from its own weight. So that's why it has to be uh, pretty lightweight when it comes to the, the deep water. So the question on our, all of our minds here is, when can we get access to this amazing cable? When is it ready for these high bandwidth networks for this amazing transatlantic uh, connectivity? We will, we will have RFS ready for service sometime late summer, and it will really depend on weather, um, whether it's going to be mid, late August or early September, but that's, it's, it's sometime late summer that we will have it. And, and now, as I said, we've already laid about 2,000 kilometers off the cable, um, and, and the rest of the cable is in the ocean being laid, so it's strictly weather-related, whether it's, whether it's a few days later or sooner. But, Certainly late summer, we will have this awesome new capacity um, in the Atlantic. So, Bjarni, what does Express mean for your global network footprint? How is it impacting uh, the speeds, the capacity uh, for your terrestrial routes? So, Jamie, as you know, um, for the past 10 years, since the beginning of time for Hibernia, we've had two transatlantic cables, and we've had a cable between Ireland and the UK, and we had a cable from Canada to, to Boston and down to New York. And we've been pretty busy building out the terrestrial network. We've been building in Europe terrestrial network then from London to Paris to Amsterdam, Brussels, Frankfurt, and, and way beyond that, now into Eastern Europe and up to Scandinavia. And likewise, on the US end, we have built in Canada to uh, Montreal, to Toronto, Quebec City, and we now actually have, uh, are, are extending it further west, uh, west of Toronto, and in the U.S. to Washington, D.C., to Chicago, and all the way to San Jose and Seattle. 
So, and then into the Pacific over other people's network, we go into Tokyo, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And a few months ago, we closed the loop. We are offering 360 services by, uh, by going from Singapore to London. So we go all, all around the world now. So, what, so th this new cable doesn't offer us a physically or geographical new uh, territories, but it makes, it, it makes us, uh, our product portfolio and offering in the Atlantic extremely unique. Because we, before we indeed had two diverse cables uh, that went north, take to the northern route while everybody else goes south. So it was either you had Hibernia, the diverse Hibernia, or you had many of one of the many other cables. But now we, have, we not only have the, the diverse north, we have the fastest um, in the Atlantic, and of course the, the latest capacity and the latest diversity. What this actually um, offers and, and the product it creates for us beyond the Atlantic is for the financial community, the four markets, the four most uh, busy markets in the world are Chicago, New York, London, and Frankfurt. And this cable is going to be the fastest between London and New York, uh, but the margin for us, it's going to be the fastest by five milliseconds. And that margin is big enough so we'll also be fastest from Chicago to anywhere in Europe, or to the financial market in Europe, and we will also be fastest from Frankfurt to any financial market in the U.S. So it is when, you, when you're comparing the or, or uh, talking about the financial city pairs in Europe and U.S., then the Express allows us to be fastest between any two of these these uh, city pairs. So it's very very unique. Um, and what are you creative for us when it comes to what we can do for the financial sector? Well, I'll tell you, um, obvious benefits for the financial markets, who they're, they're counting those milliseconds for sure, um, which equates to, to millions, potentially billions of, of, uh, of dollars. Can you tell us, are there any new customers coming to your door now that Express is imminent? Uh, you know, yes, indeed. There are the Whilst the financial sector, this is very important for the financial sector, and, and the financial sector is a good customer of ours, only only a small minority of use uh, is going to go to the financial sector. The, the, by far the most capacity and most use is for the web-centric and for the media customers that we focus uh, very much on and have focused on for the past several years. And, and these web-centrics that are offering cloud services or e-commerce, they, they are so badly hungry that if it wasn't uh, for Express, they would be running out of capacity soon. So it's those guys that are coming to us and, and benefiting the most uh, for the huge capacity that is coming online in the Atlantic. My last question for you, thank you again for being so generous with your time, but very few companies deliver on a project of this scope and magnitude. So for our companies and CEOs out there who are embarking on their dream projects, such as Project Express. Do you have any words of advice now that Express is a reality due to your hard work and leadership? Well, um, I don't know about a word, words about a wise, but I, have, I may have an opinion. Uh, first of all, um, I think you have to be a little crazy or a whole lot crazy to embark on these kind of projects. But I would say to anyone that's thinking about it, think hard. Um, think, do your homework, decide or conclude whether it is an economical, economically justi justifiable project, if there is a need, if there is a demand for it, and, and take time to, to uh, go through that process. Don't just build or aspire to build a project because it, you fancy, you think, you have a gut that there's a need for that. Uh, do, your, do your homework, check that there's a need for it. Now, and if you conclude that the answer is yes, then it's a matter of perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. A whole lot of stubbornness. That, that's, that you, you, will, you will have in the world of submarine, you will have a lot of adversity, you will, you will hit bumps in the road. It's just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Don't give up on your conviction. That's why it's so important to do your analysis in, in the beginning, in the first place, so, uh, so your conviction is founded, and then just go after it. We, we are now, we, it took us five years. Um, we had to change horses midstream. Uh, we had to change financiers midstream, but we kept at it. And I don't regret a, a, a moment of it.
And now that we have RFS right um, around the corner, Hibernia is thinking about the next express project. Oh, exciting words to end on. And very sound words. Thank you very much, Bjarni, for your time. For those of you interested in learning more about Project Express and all of Hibernia's products, please check out hibernianetworks.com. Also, check out the Hibernia team right here on the floor of Telecom Exchange. And thank you, Bjarni, for your time here. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in to JSA TV. Mm -hmm.